Welcome back everyone, it's been a while. So today we're talking about uh, Java Virtual Machine bytecode, GVM bytecode. So this is a talk about code generation. And this is the last part of our classical compiler pipeline. We might have noticed that we skipped optimization. Don't worry, we'll come back to it. But code generation is more important. The reason is that, well, first you get something that runs and then you make that run fast. Also, talking about optimization necessitates talking about cogeneration first because these two concerns are tangled. Optimization is about generating fast uh, machine code. Also, we're talking about GVM bad code, and in that case, optimization does not matter as much. And that's because we have this model here, where after semantic analysis, we go directly into bad code generation, and that bad code is executed by the virtual machine. It's the virtual machine's responsibility to optimize the bad code. So, we still have to think about performance a little bit, but not quite as much as the model where we generate machine code directly. This course is called Language and Translator, and that's the historical name, but it's not a stupid name because when you think about it, all compilers are translators and they translate towards another language which is typically lower level. Okay, so the classical approach is to translate into machine code. So for instance, uh, Intel x64 or uh, these days LVM intermediate presentation is very popular and that looks very much like uh, classical machine code. So in that approach, you need a lot of manual optimization. Machine code is obviously faster than an interpreter, but if you want to make it as fast as it possibly can go, you'll need to code these optimizations. These machine code instruction sets are very big. So for x64, there's about 1,000 instructions. It really depends how you count because there are things like modifiers that modify existing instructions and things like that. And of course, some of these instructions are quite redundant. So there's similar instruction for different kinds of data types, for instance. So it's always the same thing, just eight times. Uh, that being said, it gives you an order of magnitude. So there's a lot of instructions. It is the lowest level to which you can go. You cannot go deeper than machine code to, to run your machine. So it gives you the highest amount of control in what you can create, but it's also more work because you're working with lower level primitive. Another approach that you can take is to generate bytecode, and that's what we're doing here. And the point of the bytecode is that it's typically higher level. It gives you higher level primitive to work with. We're going to see Java bytecode, so you will uh, see what I mean there. Typically, the instruction set for bytecode is much smaller. So for the Java virtual machine, there's about 200 instructions. And actually, today in this video, we're going to see all 200 of these instructions. Again, there's actually not 200 different instructions. So some of them are quite similar and we might see blocks of 10 instructions at a time, for instance. Our approach, which is also valid, is to translate your language into another uh, language. For instance, there's this library called Java Poet and it's a library for generating Java code. So you could compile your language by translating it to Java, for instance, or to any other language. Uh, C is a very popular target uh, for com compilers. This approach is potentially the simplest because you're already familiar with language and obviously languages are higher level than bytecode or machine code, but it's also more limited because if the language wants to work in a certain way, it's not really possible to circumvent that. Sometimes it is, but not always. And so you are, you are left with the limitations of the language that you're generating. This is, by the way, also typically a criticism for bytecode. So bytecode uh, will be typically more limited than what you can do compared to machine code, but it will be easier to do. Uh, finally, for source code generation, it's potentially slow. And when I say slow, I mean the compiler will be slow or slower than if you had generated bytecode or machine code. And that's because you'll do duplicate work. So you will have your compiler, you will do your parsing and you will do your semantic analysis and then you will translate. But then say you're, you're generating Java code, this goes into the Java compiler where he has to parse the source again and he has to do semantic analysis for Java again. So all that work is really not necessary and you're paying for that. Why did I decide to teach you about code generation with GVM bytecode? Okay, why didn't I teach you LLVM for instance? So the, the most important reason is that this gives you the most bang for your buck. So with the with a small amount of effort, you might get really good results. And that's because the bytecode is higher level. And so for instance, something it offers is a built-in garbage collector. You don't have to code your own garbage collector. And this is great. 
except if you want to write a low-level language with uh, explicit memory management. Then it's not good at all because you can't do that with uh, the JVM. It also has a built-in just-in-time compiler. So it means there's no need for you to think too much about optimizations. So bytecode does not really need to be optimized. It is possible. So there's this uh, software called ProGuard, which among other things, lets you optimize bytecode. I guess that if ProGuard uh, implements these optimization, there is some point to them, or there is some edge case where it's really interesting to have them. In general, you don't need them. The, the JVM will be fast enough. What a just-in-time compiler can also do is that it can select the best instruction for your CPU. So remember we said that the Intel instruction set was 1000 expressions or even more. And one big reason for that is legacy. So they always want to be compatible with the previous version. So they just keep adding instructions. But there are big differences in performance between CPUs. So what used to be the fastest on a CPU from 20 years ago or even two years ago might not be what's the fastest on the CPU that you're going to buy today. Uh, but the just-in-time compiler can actually look at your CPU that you're running on, and it can say, oh, on this CPU, I should emit this instruction because it's faster. The big distinction to understand there is that when you compile a program to machine code, okay, say you have a C compiler and you compile a program and then you, you ship it to your customer, you are compiling on your machine, on a development machine, and then it will run on the customer machine. With a just-in-time compiler, the compiler, the just-in-time compiler, is running on the customer's machine. So it can know about their particular CPU. So it does not have to guess about which instruction to select. It just can know which ones are better. So another thing that the GVM offers you is built-in polymorphism. So polymorphism is when different things can act the same but have different behavior. And so the classical example in Java is a class inheritance. So you can override methods with a different implementation. And the JVM lets you do that very easily as long as you do it in the Java way. So you have these uh, virtual calls, which are basically uh, method calls and classes with inheritance. And interface dispatch, so basically the same thing, but when you override a method from an interface. It's also possible to implement more fancy scheme with an instruction called invoke dynamic, and we will talk about that briefly. This is very handful. If you're going to do it the Java way, if you want to do it in a way that is different, maybe you can do it with Invoke Dynamic, but maybe not. So this is an instance where uh, it's convenient as long as you go in the same direction as what the bytecode has to offer. So another advantage uh, of running on the Java virtual machine is that you get access to the Java ecosystem. You can call Java code from your bytecode very easily and uh, existing Java code can call into your language, uh, assuming you provide some kind of uh, interface for that, uh, very easily. This is not just something that exists on uh, virtual machines. So for instance, if you are emitting machine code, it might be easy to call C code. Okay, there's some calling conventions for that. It's typically a bit more scary to do that than to do it in Java. And that's because with machine code, or with C, you get access to the memory directly. So potentially, you call some C code, and this C code is going to have to mess up your whole program by writing in places where it shouldn't write. Uh, in Java, this is a bit safer and so less scary. Uh, there are some uh, nice T's, like you can actually map the GVM instructions to line in your program, so, so source code lines in your program. Something people say about the Java virtual machines that is portable. So basically, if you emit JVM bytecode, you emit the bytecode once and you package it in something called a jar, which is an archive that has bytecode in it. And then you can ship it to everyone and they can run it. And it doesn't matter if they have Windows, Linux, or Mac, as long as they have the JVM installed, they can run it. Whereas if you emit machine code, then you need to emit machine code for their particular architecture and their particular OS. Note that you might not even need to have a GVM installed. Okay, so the requirement before was you ship it to customer, the customer has the GVM installed, and then it can run uh, your jar. But there are some software packages that exist that can help you with that. So G-Link and G-Package, basically what they do is that they package your program with a GVM so that the, the customer or the, the people using the software do not have to install the GVM themselves. And, and this can be quite big because the GVM is not, is not that small. Uh, something you can do is that gpackage is something that dates from Java 9. 
and Java 9 is where they split the Java implementation into modules. And, and basically using JPackage, you can exclude some modules that you're not using. And ProGuard, which we talked about before for uh, optimizations, something it also does, and, and that's actually much more useful, is that it will look at your program and see which code is actually called. And it can remove all the code that is never called. And, and typically you can do that also for standard libraries which is very useful because if there's a part of the standard library that you never use, then you don't want to include that in your uh, archive. Another thing that's very interesting, and that's uh, GraalVL native image. So that's something that's being developed where I work at Oracle Labs. And that's a way to take your Java program and to compile it to machine code directly. Okay, so to go like the old model where you compile to a binary and then you ship this binary. So this is to say that there's quite a, a lot of flexibility there uh, even if you don't want people to have a, a, a Java virtual machine pre-installed on their machine. So is, is GVM bytecode uh, the best? Is GVM the best? No, of course not. Uh, it, it really depends what you want, but it is really interesting uh, to learn that because by investing a little bit of effort, you can get a result that's quite good because it has a, an optimizing compiler in it and it uh, has also a garbage collector in built-in polymorphism, so you don't need to reimplant all that. What we're gonna see now is actually some bytecode for a simple example. So this example is here. This is just a class that has a method that prints hello world and returns the integer 42. In Java, very simple, use Java compiler to compile this class. Uh, so this class is in a source file called main.java. This will create a bytecode file called main.class. Then you can use this command called java app and then uh, with these flags, which I don't remember what they do, but trust me, you want these flags. And what this command will do is that it will give you a list of the bytecode with also a lot of information uh, about, about the class. Uh, another thing you can do is go to this website, and this website will basically run these two commands for you, so you can give it uh, some example, and it will give you the, the, the decompiled bytecode. And this is what I used to make this screenshot here. I did that, I run that, and I will now show you the whole uh, output. I will go slightly fast on some details, especially on the bytecode instructions, because I'm going to talk about them later, but this will give you uh, a flavor and, and it will give you a sense on what we're talking about. The output you get starts with some metadata. Okay, so it says this is a class compiled that, uh, from main.java, and it's called main, and it's version 60, which is some recent version of Java. Uh, it's a public method. This super thing, don't care about it, it's historical. Uh, which class is this? And it gives you a number, and this is a reference into the constant pool. What's the constant pool? That's the next slide, but it tells you this class is main, and the super class is in uh, this slot of the constant pool, and it's uh, the object class from Java. And it tells you that this has two methods and one attribute. Okay. So the constant pool is a place where basically constant data is stored. If you emit machine code, there's also a, a data segment, they call it in machine code, where they store uh, constants. So, so what kind of constants are we talking about? There's a lot of strings. So you can see each time uh, it says UTF-8, that's an encoding, and those are strings. There's a method reference, and you see that Whenever we refer uh, the constant pool, so this two here and this three here, those are references to the constant pool. Okay, so there are pointers in there. Each time we have these um, references, the tool is very nice and gives us a comment to say what is stored there. Okay, so the method references reference number two, which is a class, and a class is an object, a Java object. And in this Java object, we have a reference number four, which is a string which contains a uh, java slash lang slash object. Okay, and, and this is like referenced here. So the method reference references the class and also references number three, which is a name and a type. And the name is init, and that's the name that Java uses for constructors. And a type, and this is a special notation it uses for types, and this basically means this is a method with no parameters and it returns void. Okay, and then it just collates all of that together and that's the method ref. Uh, there is the same thing for fields, this is a reference to the field system out, which is a print stream. 
um, you can see your string. So this is the object string from Java. Okay, like we have string x equal hello world. Well, that will be string. And then it references some character data, which is going to be actually the UTF-8 encoded uh, hello world string. Okay, I think that's enough for a constant pool. You, you get the idea. Remember I said here, there are two methods in the class. Why are there two methods? Because we only wrote one method, right? Well, the second method is actually the constructor. Every class in Java must have an explicit constructor or an implicit one that is automatically created. So see here, there are some colors on the side and these colors will be useful in the listing to see what, what's what. And so red is here for class main and that's gonna be for a constructor. And then these two lines here are gonna be for a method foo. So as you can see, we have some red here and those are the bytecode instructions that are generated for the constructor. Around uh, these red lines, we have a bunch of metadata. So, you know, they call it main because it's a constructor. Uh, it has no parameters and returns void. It is public. The maximum size for the stack. So that's what we're going to use to run the program. I will talk about that later. It's one. There's one local and there's one argument. And actually the, the local and the argument in this case are the same. And what are they? Well, they are the this pointer. So it tells you here, we start using the local zero. This is not bad code, by the way. This is just uh, an annotation uh, to make your life easy. And so what the, does the code do? It takes uh, whatever is in the local zero, so the local variable zero, and it's, it pushes it on the stack. Then it uses invoke special. Invoke special is, is something you use to invoke some special things in Java. And in this case, the special thing is the constructor. Okay, so it gives you in the the constant pool reference, which is a reference to the method in it for the constructor. And then it returns. Okay, so this basically does nothing except invoking the super constructor, which is uh, defined in Java lang object. Then you get some more annotations for debugging. So uh, they say that line two is matched to instruction zero, and it gives you that uh, the variable zero uh, holds the, the, the this pointer. Then we have the method foo that's more interesting. So again, this has no arguments, returns an integer, it is public. The maximum size of the stack is two. There's one local variable, which is again this. So what do we do here? We get the system.out field. So out is a field, a static field in system. So that's why you use get static. Then we use load constant and we load the constant 13 and that's the string hello world. So we push that on the stack. So now on the stack, we have the field out and the string. We use invoke virtual to invoke a virtual method, which is println that we call system out the println hello world. Okay. And, and that's indeed uh, the blue thing is system.out.println hello world. The green thing is a uh, return 42. So what we do for that is that we use this instruction b push to push 42 on the stack, and then we use i return to return an integer. Okay. So don't worry if that's too fast. We are going to see all these instructions, and it will become much clearer. And then uh, I'll revisit this example after we've seen the instructions, so that it, it, it becomes very clear. Okay. So the video is quite long already. So what I will do is that I will talk to you about bytecode instructions in the next video. I'll see you next time.